Um, first of all, thanks to the organizers um, for letting me talk to you a little bit about what we've done. This has actually been, a, as uh, Trevor and, and Pete both alluded to, a, a passion of mine. I think one of the real powerful things at, at Scripps is to be able to work on things like malaria uh, for part of my time and then think about all the things uh, in the for-profit drug discovery sector uh, at the same time. It's one of the real, I think, one of the real strengths and the thing that keeps me uh, pulling out of the garage in the morning and, and, and coming to work. Um, I also know that I only have 10 minutes, and I've been told that uh, if I don't get done in time, Jamie's going to come up on stage and escort me out. Maybe it's an audition for his Academy Award hosting uh, gig that he may be pushing for, but I'm going to try to go through this and tell you a little bit about what we've done in Malaria. So um, as, as Trevor pointed out during lunch, I think I, I won't belay that the, the global malaria disease burden has fallen, and it's fallen significantly throughout the world. But in fact, we're starting to see a plateau. And just to put everything in perspective, the, 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 obviously the number of deaths uh, has plateaued for 38,000 deaths uh, in 2015. That has essentially stayed the same, uh, as Trevor pointed out. But the one thing that was that really caught my eye is that, in fact, in very low resource environments, working under $2 a day, up to 6% of the income of these families is actually spent to treat or prevent their family from getting just one disease. I would argue that in America, this is about 10% is spent across all diseases. So maybe cancer in the US is spent in the way that malaria is spent in the developing world. But in fact, this is a major impact not only to families, but also to these nations where GDP loss is about 3% just from this one disease alone. And it has a tremendous impact uh, on folks. As I mentioned, there's significant resistance um, there is no currently approved therapies to address all life cycle stages of malaria, which I'll get to. Uh, a molecule I was fortunate to work on uh, when uh, we were at GNF uh, as a molecule KF156, though it's still in clinical development. And one of the other key aspects is, is to really be able to address not only the parts of the world where there's still significant deaths, such as in the sub-Saharan Africa, but also critically important to be able to maintain zero, which is in the countries where we have been successful in eliminating or being close to eliminating malaria, what type of uh, preventative measures can we come up with to maintain that zero? So this is the life cycle stage of the, uh, of the parasite. Uh, and I'll just starting here at 1 o'clock, essentially, we have several different approaches we're using right now. And there's really five major ways to address the life cycle of malaria parasite. One of this is this chemical vaccine platform, which I'll talk about, but essentially centered around chemo prevention. I'll talk a little bit about KF156, but then some new molecules we're working on in the lab, which essentially are pan-targeted therapies for all of these cycles of the parasite, both asexual reproduction in the liver, in the blood, as well as the sexual reproductive stages that then allow the transmission back to mosquitoes. And malaria is very unique in the fact that the mosquito and humans are really the only two hosts for the parasite, such that this cycle could also potentially be a way to dramatically reduce uh, malaria infections and prevent infections. I'll talk a little bit about the reframe library, which I've been very fortunate to be involved in building at Caliber uh, with uh, a, a, a huge effort with many, many different folks. And then how to use these smaller chemical libraries of reframe to really explore novel liver stage biology. I'll also uh, get a chance to tell you a little bit about our long-acting mosquitocidals, which both Pete uh, and Trevor alluded to, which we're actively doing chemistry on, to really find better compounds that could block the parasite from going from mosquito back into uh, healthy humans. So one such approach is this idea of an injectable approach. And this is, in itself is not a new concept. In, in, in actuality, many diseases, for example, antipsychotics, uh, as well as very, very old formulations, for example, penicillin benzathine salts, have been used for this idea of being able to use an injectable or a chemical vaccine approach. Uh, as everyone uh, may be aware, typical oral drugs, high Cmax, relatively, relatively fast clearance, but could we actually flatten the PK curve where we needed to maintain drugs above, above a certain level and maintain a minimal concentration for efficacy? And actually, could we then reduce the possibility for toxicity that's driven typically by Cmax, but maybe also by other factors and be able to get a long-acting approach of drugs? And we started off with a very well-known molecule. As a matter of fact, I'm sure many of you have taken it. It's atovaquone, which is one of the two components in malarone, which is the primary oral prophylactic agent given uh, for people. Interestingly enough, trials in sub-Saharan Africa have shown that if you give oral 
prophylaxis for one week and then three weeks off, you can actually dramatically reduce malaria infection to below greater than 99% efficacy. But that still requires somebody to take a pill every day for seven days. And the question is, could we actually do it such that with one single administration of the drug, you get three to four months protection potentially through an entire uh, infection season? And the way we've done that has really been by modifying this known drug, atovaquone. We've been able to make simple esters of this molecule. And this graph just demonstrates the exposure of these prodrugs formulated in a way either as an oil-based solution or an aqueous suspension, where now we would be thinking about, based on this sort of PK profile, very long tails out to many days, and a flattening of the PK profile like I showed. We've been able to show that you could actually administer a drug uh, an atovacone prodrug ester in volumes as low as 250 to 500 microliters. So now we're talking about the volumes that young kids get for prophylaxis for biological-based vaccines and maintaining the drug concentration above this level such that you can have protection for a C uh, after a single administration to as long out to as 100 days. And in fact, now we're working with MMV and a, and a, and a, and a group at J&J &J on global health, but again, J&J has had a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of background in doing this in the antipsychotic and other spaces where patient compliance of taking oral drugs significantly limits its efficacy and be able to move this forward. And in fact, this is now in GLP talks. These molecules are in GLP talks with the administration of First and Man later this year. The other way to potentially have a major impact on preventing malaria is to improve the efficacy, safety, as well as cost of potential prophylactic agents. And as I mentioned, we have been working on a series of compounds that can address all life cycle stages, such that it can be used for prophylaxis, it can be used for prevention, and it could be potentially used down the road to prevent other uh, further uh, uh, effects of the malaria parasite. And so we've worked on a series of compounds now. We've actually, and this is in lead optimization right now. Our lead molecule is MCLB786, and you can see that at a dose as low as 10 mg per kg, we essentially get a flattening of the parasitemia in mouse models, and is now on par with the molecule that we worked on previously, KF156, again, allowing us to address potential multiple, this is a blood stage infection assay, to be able to address multiple life cycle stages of this compound as well. And this is currently in lead optimization uh, at Caliber in uh, collaboration with uh, uh, the GHDDI Institute in Beijing, which is also uh, uh, working on a variety of uh, neglected tropical diseases that we have a collaboration with, uh, which has been exceptionally fruitful. Uh, the next part I want to talk about is a little bit about Reframe. This was uh, introduced by several folks, and as a matter of fact, I think uh, Reframe has been mentioned many, many times throughout the course of the day. It's really one of the platform technology and tools that we've developed at Caliber that is actually available to the larger scientific community. And in fact, anyone can get this compound collection free of charge if they're working in the neglected tropical disease space. And what we've been able to do is generate a compound collection now of about 14,000 compounds, which allows us to get to clinical proof of concept very quickly. We have two such examples already in the clinic. And could we actually take a very small, comp relatively small compound set versus screening millions of compounds and make that collection available to various folks? And in fact, we have one such example with Dennis Kyle's lab at University of Georgia, where we've been actually been able to screen reframe in a 384 well assay of Plasmodium vivax hypnozoites. This is essentially dormant parasite that sits in the liver and then upon some uh, uh, unknown uh, mechanisms gets reactivated. And in fact, this assay can only be run in endemic parts of the world. And so in fact, we shipped a plate reader and all of these compounds to a lab in Thailand, send a postdoc for three months, and actually conducted the screen. So this is the idea of essentially democratizing biology and drug discovery where you don't need to know a chemist. We built this collection by synthesizing 7,000 compounds in about a year and a half each one, one by one, at 20 milligrams. They didn't have to know that. They simply got a collection that they knew they could screen in an endemic area of the disease. And finally, I wanted to mention the oral insecticides, only because uh, Jim, obviously, Jim Schaefer has had a dramatic role in the role of ivermectins and, and, and use of ivermectins. But in fact, as Trevor alluded to during lunch, we've now found a series of compounds that isoxazolines as a, a collaboration with TropIQ uh, in the Netherlands where we could potentially give a single dose of an oral agent to last for two to three months. And in fact, we know that there are additional things that we may need to do with this compound. So in fact, while this is a very good starting point, there are some known toxicities around the isoxazoline class. And though while the PK and efficacy looks quite good, we are actually thinking about how we could further improve this molecule to have a better profile 
for treatment in humans to meet that very high safety bar that uh, Trevor mentioned earlier. It should be interesting to point out that 50 milligrams of this drug is, in fact, can cover out to three months to be able to impact not only mosquitoes, but other potential vectors involved in many other transmissions. So with that, many people to thank for this job. Uh, I want to thank everyone at Caliber, very interdisciplinary troops, obviously our funders, TropIQ for a very uh, useful collaboration in the indexicide space. And thank you for your time.